We think we're this person. We've created this person. Our parents have created yeah. this person. Our family members, our girlfriends, our boyfriends. Yeah. We have this whole person that's actually not really who we are. Right. An alter ego, perhaps. The alter ego, yeah. And you know, sometimes we get so caught up in the repetition of that alter ego that we forget that it's an alter ego. Yeah. Sometimes that becomes us. And we fall into the trap of allowing ourselves to be singular in something that doesn't actually reflect our soul's real content. Nothing you do matters unless what you do matters. I'm Emeron Delerba, and this is Get Real or Die Trying. Hey, hey tribe, Emmanon Delerba here. Welcome to episode 16 of my podcast. Today I had the pleasure of sitting down with Fitzgerald Pucci. He has the uh, Deconstruct podcast, which uh, I stumbled across about a week ago. And uh, I was first actually attracted to some of the titles uh, before I even listened. I just liked what I was seeing, you know, the titles. And I thought this guy was conscious. Did a little Googling, came across some of his uh, videos, listened to some of his podcasts, and I thought he'd be uh, a great guy to have on the show. I thought we would vibe pretty well. So how you doing today, man? Man, I'm honored, first and foremost, by just, that's it's reaching deep. I'm feeling great today. Like nice. I said a little beforehand, I've been in a period of some deep, constructive work with a couple of the folks I really trust. So I'm coming in here with pretty big load today. I'm real excited for what we'll get to talk about. Cool. Cool, man. Well, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Uh, for our audience, this is the first time we've ever met right here virtually, uh, screen through screen here. So we're just having a, a candid conversation. Uh, two brothers in pursuit here. And uh, looks like we actually uh, started our podcast around the same time. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about how you would describe yourself? And then uh, sure. I had some questions for you based upon some of the podcasts uh, I listened to and just some things I thought we could jive on. Absolutely. Well, uh, first and foremost, I consider myself an emotional literacy educator. I run the Deconstruct podcast, and a lot of that is focusing on addressing some of the overall societal myths that get impressed upon us from just the, the, the different rites of passage that we absorb. There are a lot of things that teach us that we don't really understand or teach us. So every week we take one of these larger societal teachings, we give some historical context, we break it down, we offer some new perspectives in the hopes of going through this journey of getting more free together, piece by piece. I do a lot of organizing in the central Massachusetts area. We've been hosting a lot of protests in towns that have not seen a protest in a very long time, hmm. trying to organize and mobilize uh, some of the big worldly changes taking place. A lot of the work that we're doing is saying these small communities in the middle of Massachusetts have not been paying much attention to the, the grief and the pain going across the United States. And we asked, well, why are we out of the equation here? Mm -hmm. So we've been organizing five or six different towns in the area, coaching protest leads, creating educational weekly identity calls, and hosting the podcast and the greater collective hope that we can start to transform the societal and cultural fabric of the central Massachusetts area. It's very cool. Rad so far. Good for you, man. Uh, it sounds like you're doing a lot of great work and you're connected to your local community and trying to organize, inspire, and uh, ignite some change. That's really good, man. Thank you so much. I was also, you know, I was attracted to the name of your, of your podcast, uh, Deconstruct, because something I, similar concept, I think, that I say a lot of my podcasts is that we need to unlearn. Yes. You know, it's kind of like deconstructing, but we have to unlearn because we learn so many wrong things growing up in today's society and this culture. And we have to kind of unlearn these things. We get to a point in uh, our adult life at some point where we start realizing the things we learned are actually really not benefiting our souls. They're not benefiting our yeah. growth, our intellectual, spiritual, emotional growth. 
that aren't benefiting us in our human connection to other people. And we learn a lot of separations, you know, like you're talking about in, in the community and what's going on in this country right now, there's so much separation. Yeah. And uh, a lot of that is learned behavior passed down from their fathers, their grandfathers, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. And so coming into a, a, a sense of one thing you mentioned in one of your podcasts, or maybe it was your speech, uh, you, you had a great speech called A Comfortable Evil that I saw wow. online. Thank I took a, few little, took a few little notes. I really appreciated a lot of what you had to say there. Another thing that stood out to me was um, you mentioned uh, accountability. That's something I talk about almost every podcast, yeah. especially as men in this culture today, we really need to start uh, having accountability, you know, for our actions and, and taking accountability. And you talked about, I think it was more in relation to uh, the Black Lives Matter and the learned behavior of racism and really starting to take accountability right. and, and, and changing it. And so I really appreciated that because again, to me, accountability is a high spiritual virtue yes. that isn't, there's not a lot of emphasis on it in the world. Like we don't go around saying, Hey, I want to be accountable, <laughs> you know? right. Right. but it really should be. It really should be one of those top things because when you're accountable and you pursue that accountability and you take responsibility to change yes. and to change yourself, uh, you can really see progress in your own life and the lives of others around you. And it takes courage, it takes commitment uh, to be accountable. Yeah. And talk a little bit about how you see, uh, what does it mean? I think you, you talk about you're in a very small town, you're in a rural area. Right. You said there hasn't been a lot of protests there, probably a lot of uh, complacency, uh, stagnation. Absolutely. What can the average person in that town, what does it mean for them to take accountability in their life? Right. Well, a lot of the ways of a, a small town like myself have found comfort in very familiar rhythms, mm -hmm. very familiar expectations of what every day looks like. And at this point, you know, people have been doing the same thing for so many times. They may be losing track of the things that are slightly uncomfortable in their day-to-day -day basis. They may be losing track of the things that originally didn't make sense but through the act of repetition and through the act of repeated exposure just become normalized. So I think one of the most essential aspects of bringing a small town community to the point of being primed and ready for a discussion about accountability is finding out what toxic aspects of culture have been normalized because every person has this like this like lining over their skin with the habits the routines the thoughts the the way they interact and as they practice that this film kind of starts building thicker and thicker and it as someone in a small town practices small town ideologies we are 98% white, so racialized conversation never takes place from the advocacy side of those that aren't white. And that, that those layers keep building up as one continues normalizing themselves to their world. Mm -hmm. That layer needs to find a way to be broken it needs to find a way to gently be removed from the individual. One of the things that I talk about a lot is the way that slavery in the United States, when it was first introduced, was a deeply cruel and abnormal practice. And it was only through the encouragement and the repetition of the actions of cruelty alongside the justification of these events. Mm -hmm. The first thing that happens, and justification is so important here, when someone brings up an idea that challenges those normal everyday interactions, one of the first things to come out for a small town community are the justifications, the defenses, mm -hmm. the I'm not racist, the I have all of these friends that are black, that are brown, that are not white. I don't have a racist bone in my body. Mm -hmm. A very wise man by the name of Dr. Ibram X. Kendi said this quote that's been sticking in my mind all the way through for the past month. The heartbeat of racism, when we're looking at it from the Black Lives Matter perspective of taking accountability, 
the heartbeat of racism is in the denial of itself. So one of the first things that we need to normalize in one of these communities is the suspension of the excuses, of the reactions, of mm -hmm. the defenses, the justifications. It's being able to come to a point where all of the little things in us that want to fight and kick and scream when they are confronted, to be able to de-escalate those things within ourselves to a point of, you know, maybe I don't have everything right. That is really, I believe, the first step to taking accountability. But it can be such a strenuous, energy-consuming process. Because I've really seen that when someone who has normalized themselves, when they're exposed to that, the entire arsenal of defenses generally needs to come out like opening the Pandora's box and all of these bugs and snakes, things with scales and fangs and ugliness yeah. kind of need to leave the box. Yep. And it's only when that box is depleted can you really have those conversations that bring the idea of maybe there are things that I can find strength in taking accountability for. Yeah. Now you bring up a lot of, a lot of great points there, and it. Thank you. It kind of reminds me of my own philosophy and of uh, being willing to look in the mirror and see your ugly side, yeah. see your weaknesses, yeah. see the things that we don't want to see, you know, and, and look at that that Pandora's box of the scales and the snarling aspects of our personalities uh, that are not really conducive to optimum human performance, you know, yes. and, and being basically being a loving soul and, and being a, and being a human that connects. Um, you talked about this in your podcast too, which I really like the concept of multiplicity. And, um, you know, I talk about duality and uh, the duality of man, uh, man and woman, you know, men, <laughs> creatures, right. human beings is that to me, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated with the kind of the battle between our human nature and our spiritual nature. You know, yeah. because we are spiritual beings and we, and we, but we're in this constant battle. And the more that we try and spiritize our hearts and our minds, the more we try and elevate our spiritual consciousness, uh, we're at war with our lower self and our higher self, yeah. our human nature and our spiritual nature and coming in, you know, and all of us, every human being is a dichotomy in some sense. I was just telling my wife, I'm a fool and I'm a sage. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, I'm a dichotomy exactly. and I'm trying, I'm trying to be more the sage and less the fool. Right. But if I were to say that I'm a sage and not accept that I can be a fool as well, then I'm, you know, I'm just basically full of shit. <laughs> right, right. You know? Just having the awareness to grow. Yeah, that's a perfect point that you bring up there. And I really think that being able to end the war that exists between those two dualities comes in finding the balance where the child and the sage can meet and begin to fulfill yeah. each other's needs. Yeah, thus the duality of meeting, how to grow up, take responsibility, be accountable, and be mature, yeah. be a mature adult, but also have that childlike nature. And what is that childlike nature? To me, it's about purity. You see, children are more innately, more pure, and they, they have more virtues than adults because they've had less time to be corrupted. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's um, such a good way to put and, it. And so a childlike nature is really just a more pure nature. They're more loving. Yeah. They, yeah. they don't have preconceived judgments of people when they meet them, you know. Yeah. They, don't, they just don't see these things because they haven't learned all of these and absorbed them like you were talking about earlier. Yeah. You know, they don't have these layers of um, wrong learning. And so that childlike nature that we need to pursue, to me, is really purity. And then, then, then you get to the crossroads of, wow, how do I become more pure? That's where the work comes in. You have to be able yes. to like sit down and say, that's what we were talking about. Look in the mirror and say, dang, man, like, I'm ugly. This part of me is ugly. Yeah. This ego in me is ugly or this competition in me is ugly or whatever it is. Having the courage and the accountability to look in the mirror or look in the mirror. Sometimes the mirror is a friend, yeah. is a lover, is a loved one, is your mentor, is your spiritual elder, is your teacher who says, you know what, this isn't working. 
And you should want that in your life. And I've talked about that a lot of my podcasts, really seeking out the the sage, yeah. if you will, the teachers, the spiritual elders in one's life to have that guidance, to have that correction, which was what my last podcast was about, care confrontation versus correction. Um, you know, and really wanting that so you can you can better yourself, change yourself, improve yourself. And I think a lot of the concepts you touched on in some of your podcasts, you seem to really be uh, exploring human nature and the pursuit to kind of um, deconstructing the wrong things we've learned, but also embracing and coming into the new paradigm and the correct ways of how we conduct ourselves. And the conversation you're having with yourself and with others is a conversation that uh, millions of people need to be having. Yeah. Right. It says you mentioned something. I didn't look at my notes here real quick in your speech that it was a it was a concept that I really liked because it reminded me of a concept that I talk about here. Yeah. Um, well, I think you were talking about the society's pressure uh, towards singularity, and um, and 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 what I thought about was a, a concept in a book called the Urantia book that I read, and the Urantia book is a it's a big subject. I have to touch on that but it's a revelation an epical revelation that came to this planet through anonymous sleeping prophet and anyways there's a concept called unity without uniformity yes yes and that's what we need to have we can still have unity without uniformity we don't all have to you know be the uniform uh patterns you know and look the same and act the same and, and and really trying to get to that consciousness of unity without uniformity you also said something you said the word, um, you probably don't remember, maybe you do remember radical something. I don't think I took the note. Radical I was, trust in the human ability yes. to grow. And radical I really trust. liked that. I really liked that because, well, one, we, we, we do, uh, we, lose, we lose faith in humanity. We lose faith in each other. Yes. And yes. the radical trust in, in the human nature to grow reminded me of a concept of my father's that he talks about called radical unity. Yeah. And I, I, I used to talk about that. And people would ask me, why is it radical? What's what's radical about unity? I'm like, well, it's radical because we're so far from it. Yeah. <laughs> the norm is yeah. to be divided. So unity itself is radical. <laughs> We've made such a tremendous departure from the original teachings, which this country was founded upon. Exactly yeah. as you say, the, the immigration and the, the, the multiplicity of perspectives that have shaped American culture. We're currently at this point where there is a cultural war that's being held that is trying to commit a concept that I call cultural genocide. Yep. It's trying to homogenize itself and it's trying to put, once again, white supremacy is rearing its ugly head and it's contesting, it's seeking to fight and to wound the other cultural aspects that are existing that have made this country so powerful and diverse in its thoughts. And a lot of the people in my hometown, they see these different opinions, they see these different perspectives of black folks, brown folks, queer folks, disabled folks, of indigenous people that are living around our areas. And they see them as threats. They see the unfamiliar as threats because one of the biggest conditions, one of the most toxic aspects to the white supremacist culture that has sort of been cultivated is the indulgence of this vivid sense of paranoia and what we are unfamiliar with. When really, as you said earlier, some of the most powerful teachers that we can come across are those that we interact with. And every additional aspect, every new perspective that comes into this conversation has the potential to really teach us. I have some beautiful mentors, incredibly gentle, kind-hearted men that have taken me and shaped me and gone through this powerful journey. And I also recognize that some of my greatest teachers have been some of my fiercest opponents in the course Mm -hmm. of my life. Mm-hmm. There have been calls that I that have been directed at me to face the ugliness of my own past. There have been calls for accountability that were incredibly painful at first. And it's only with a little bit of time, only with a little bit of that process where I was able to convert the fear that I had 
of being called out into a gratitude. Mm -hmm. Some of the deepest lessons that have changed and helped me heal myself the deepest have come from people that have originally meant for my harm. And I think that was one of the hardest lessons that I ever had. It plugs in here where if we are able to see the views which challenge our existence and feel uncomfortable to what is normal as opportunities to grow, it changes the entire perspective of how scary the world can be. And it heals at its very core's root that paranoia clutching so many of the people in my community up. Yeah, no, it's it's beautiful, and I love the way your mind uh, sees that and uh, and and approaches healing. I think, and you know, it sounds like for you that you you had something in your life where you realized you had to take accountability for your actions. You know, I did. and we all have that in very degrees. Um, everyone actually has something in their life they need to take account accountability for, whether they've taken accountability or not. It's another thing. But right. what, what I like about what you're saying is that you got to that point. It was made clear to you by your mentors, your teachers, yeah. your elders, another word I like to use. I love and, that word. And you, you accepted it and you embraced it. And that happens to me every day. <laughs> Where yeah, I'm, having yeah. to, I'm having to take accountability for my actions and being pointed out to me and, <laughs> I just, it's, it's beautiful, but it's also kind of sad that, uh, so few people experience what you and I experience right. in, in this, in this and feel that way or have come to that place where we feel like it's, it's, um, uh, we feel blessed, you know? Yeah. And, and some people, they avoid it. You know, it is a blessing, but a lot of people avoid it and a lot of people don't seek it out and a lot of people don't want to take accountability. Right. And so... Right. I think all we can do is just talk about it, share, and and I think share about how it's blessed us. I think when people hear personal testimony, yeah, and they understand, like, wow, this this person is saying this helped them grow, and it was beautiful for their soul, and it was a blessing to them. It you might shift really their thinking a little bit. Courage, yeah, you can give people the courage to say if this person can do this, maybe yeah. I can too. You know, I saw a movie where well, we're talking a little bit about you know we talk. Black Lives Matter and racism and that white supremacy and that wrong thinking. I saw a great movie the other night called uh, Burden with uh, Forrest Whitaker. It's based on a true story of a KK clans member who basically had a change of heart because the love and acceptance of this black preacher who was Forrest Whitaker, whose very own uncle was lynched and hanged by the KKK. Um, and he still showed love and took this KK member into his own home and and basically through love and acceptance transformed this guy yeah. to basically repent and change his way of thinking, living, and being. And I mean it's a power and it's a true story. And at the end they show they show a clip of the of the guy uh, talking and, and and it's really quite powerful story and I think if that could it just is an example of, of how these people can change their thinking through love and even I yeah. was watching this thinking man this preacher's got a lot of balls I mean he's really a courageous guy to have this guy in his home and to show that type of love yeah. he could be filled with so much hatred yeah. but he was the real deal he was walking the walk man I mean he's, he's a preacher he's the real deal he's not a facade there's no bullshit there, man. Yeah. He was doing what Jesus would have done. Yeah. The real Jesus, Truly. not our little ideas of Jesus. Not our, he was not doing... our uh, societally indoctrinated. Team. Exactly. Yeah. He was doing the real deal, Jesus, you yeah. know, taking this man to his home and, and showing him uh, unconditional love. Yeah. And then therefore it transformed him, which I thought was quite a powerful story. That's really hitting me deep. I talk about radical trust and I, I, I think, what does that look like? And what you just told me to take in the descendants That's of someone responsible for the death of a family member into your own house yeah and trust it that they can be healed yeah that's about as radical radical as trust yeah. yeah serious and that's the stuff that's really going to change the world i think yeah and imagine you know it, it after watching that, I had the thought, imagine if all media that was put out and all movies had this type of beautiful 
informative, inspiring spiritual message. Yeah. And it, you know, here we are, you and I are in a conversation about this movie I saw, but imagine if millions of people were, instead we're talking about, you know, the Fast and the Furious, and we're talking about the blockbuster Transformers, and we're talking about the Kardashians, and whatever the yeah. hell people are talking about. And all, all the this drama media that and drama. Love to just yeah, mindless suck banter. Up. Yeah. Mindless banter. Yeah. The arts and media should be presenting these true stories and these inspiring acts of men and women throughout time and currently living yeah. who are doing great things. But we. It's a way that the the powers that be control the masses by just pumping out yes meaningless banter right you it's know it's very profitable that banter oh yeah absolutely and it feeds off of those layers that we develop yeah I think a lot of consumers who have been indoctrinated regularly to find their sense of gratification from taking the wrapper peeling it off and consuming whatever's inside yeah. For a lot of folks that is the closest thing to catharsis that they come across hmm. and i don't think they realize that the more they depend on the cycle of consumption the more they are being consumed mm -hmm. and it's deeply profitable to focus on the dramatic aspects to focus on the conflicts to focus on things that uh, distract us from liberation that's interesting that's a cool concept it's kind of the more that you consume yeah the more that your soul is being consumed yeah by them you know the more that you uh, pursue consumption and the overconsumption, the more that your soul is consumed yeah by you know, basically the meaningless and lifeless uh, corporations and entities and wrong culture and wrong thinking that's stealing your soul away from right. you. That's kind of an interesting yeah. thing there. Yeah. It's really making us compromise our humanity the more yeah. we participate in that structure. Yeah. And that's one of the biggest goals of a large corporate soulless society to mm -hmm. remove us from our sense of humanity and mm -hmm. turn us into dividends. The lack trends. of connection, yeah. When you yeah. when you have a lack of connection with yourself, with your fellow hu human next to you, I, uh, it's easier to control, but you're also, you're then more capable of doing wrong. Yeah, you and know? going back to the idea of what made slavery less horrifying to an American populace way back in the day, they had to train themselves to separate this one demographic of people from the concept of humanity. Dehumanization is such a part of the primer to enable what's harming us mm -hmm. to justify that harm. Yeah. You, let's, let's circle back a little bit. You mentioned we were talking about... Uh children yes and childlike and you were starting to tell me a story i think or you're were, you're were going somewhere and i might have right. diverted the conversation but you're talking about how we uh at a young age are, are taught to to do things or to unlearn things i i, I feel like i might have cut you out because i liked where you were going and then we got excited about something else but so in my childhood state, I feel like I was one of, that may have been one of the wisest points of my upbringing to this point, mm. all, all the way until the age of 24. And everything mm. that I've been doing from, I'd say, 21, 22 onwards has been trying to get back to that initial period mm -hmm. of being easily impressed with the world around me, having mm. Such a thin membrane exists between my body and the world around me. Being so susceptible to the sun on my skin and the breeze through my hair and the sound of the birds and all of the aspects of beauty in my environment. I miss having a skin so thin because it felt like I was in a constant state of communion. Mm -hmm. Self and the world around yeah when, when you were talking i was thinking what you're describing is basically being in the moment yeah being present 
Yeah. But as we grow as adults with responsibilities, with the corruption of our purity, basically, yeah. we're, we're never happy and satisfied in the moment. Right. The breeze in our hair, the sun shining, we become calloused. Our skin becomes callous. Yes. That thin membrane goes away and we lose yeah. the magic. We lose the appreciation and we lose the gratitude for the beauty of the simplicity of existence. I love the word callous that you use. I was just having this conversation with someone the other day about just observing my little three-year-old yeah. and just how the joy and excitement that, that she can have and, and any most children can have yeah. over such beautiful things and that we harm ourselves by not allowing ourselves to have that childlike excitement right. and that, you know, there's something to it. But really what it is, is that children, for me, the spiritual lesson that I'm, I'm learning as from being a father myself yeah. is that children live in the moment. Right. So much better than adults. Yeah. They're in the moment. My father, Gabriel Urantia, who's a spiritual teacher and he's a writer, he talks about the eternal moment and being in the eternal moment. And that there is the duality of appreciating the moment is actually linked to having a distinct understanding and respect for eternity. Yeah. And so, you know, the moment you can, you can appreciate and be in the moment when you have a sense of eternity because you know where you're going. You know that this moment is qualified by eternity itself. Yes, yes. I love the idea of eternity validating the constant stream of now. That's so, that's yeah. it. Yeah. I, I, and you know, what causes our skin to callous? Mm -hmm. I think that is a great place to explore. Well, the first cut is the deepest. Mm -hmm. Our children, we have not, set any sort of internal process to protect ourselves from some of the hard aspects of the world, some of the difficult, scary, troubling things. So as I began to experience some of that pain, I said, I don't like that. I don't want to have to deal with that. I want to find ways to protect myself against that. So the, the joy and the wonder and I really feel one of the things that allowed me to be so wise as a child was in my ability to be naive in my trust. I was so able to give that because I had never been hurt. And as I grew, I grew these calluses. I grew these layers to protect and insulate myself from the hurt. Now that I've sort of gone through the mouth of some very deep hurts in my own experience, I've realized that maybe this pain isn't something that I need to be as afraid of as I previously was. I was telling someone the other day that saying, hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. You know, hurt people, hurt other people because they're hurt. And... um that's and a so, in four words, honestly. Yeah, really. I mean, a huge discussion there and, and, and seeking that personal healing. It kind of circles all the way back to the, to the beginning of our conversation about taking accountability, yeah. and changing ourselves and healing ourselves yeah. so that we can be loving people who love people right. instead of hurt people who hurt people. Wow. You know, yeah. and, and getting to that point, into that consciousness and that state of being, uh, it, it, it actually isn't easy. It takes a lot of exploration. Yes. It takes a lot of emotional, spiritual, psychological healing yeah. and analysis and going within and changing, deconstructing, <laughs> unlearning, yeah. Yeah. Um, tearing down, like dying to thyself. Right. Um, you know, a lot of us have these, one of my podcasts was about, you know, having a facade. We have these facades. Yeah. We... We think we're this person. Love We've you. created this person. Our parents have created yeah. this person. Our family members, our girlfriends, our boyfriends. Yeah. We have this whole person that's actually not really who we are. Right. An alter ego, perhaps. The alter ego, yeah. And, you know, sometimes we get so caught up in the repetition of that alter ego that we forget that it's an alter ego. Yeah. Sometimes that becomes us. And we fall into the trap of allowing ourselves to be singular in something that doesn't actually reflect our soul's real content. 
Yeah, and I, I I was listening to a, you know Mike Tyson has a podcast that yeah. the heavyweight boxer. <laughs> yeah. you know, he he's going through his own kind of spiritual uh, discovery, and you know he, talk about the exact example of an alter ego. He was the heavyweight champion of the world. Right. This whole big you know alter ego, and he said on his podcast, he said, you know what, I I've, I've been living in my alter ego for my whole life. Yeah, I was the heavyweight champion of the world. I was this mean guy. I was this vicious boxer. I was this killer. Exactly. I was this. This was all. And he goes, that's not even who I am. Yeah. I'm just now discovering who I am. I'm Mike Tyson. He's like, I'm a nice, funny guy. He's like, yeah. I don't even know who that old Mike Tyson is. I don't even know him anymore. That was all just my alter ego. Yeah. So it's really cool to see like other people and even him in an exaggerated form because we all talk about having an alter ego, but imagine actually having it, living it, being in it, personifying yeah. it. And it really, in your life, you're the heavyweight champion. You're making millions. Anywhere you go, people are kissing your ring, basically. Yeah, exactly. You know? So that was like, he is the exact example of that. And here he is years later, like deconstructed. Yeah. <laughs> here he yeah. is years later, like, whoa, that was, I don't even know who that guy was. Yeah. This is, I'm finally discovering who I am, you know? <laughs> I just found uh, another circumstance like that that really hit me so deep. Uh, do you know the rapper DMX? Oh, yeah. yeah definitely. Yes. Yeah, for super sure. Super hardcore, super <laughs> tough. Oh, yeah. Just a, a straight up original gangster bad ass. <laughs> he drops it hard. I found out he has a, he has a garden of orchids that he tends to. Um, there you go. Make it a basis. <laughs> and I, I'm seeing DMX, one of the hardest dudes in the industry, watering his orchids. There you go. And I think he actually might read the book, the Urantia book I was mentioning too. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, it brings me so much joy, especially in the realm of the persona of masculinity, especially mm -hmm. from the hard persona, from the conqueror. To be able to see people express a genuine self of gentleness that acknowledges the hard self and just yeah. sense that. That's so cool, yeah. And you know, one of the really beautiful things that I found about being soft, being sensitive, when you're around people that don't have pure intentions, you can smell them from a mile away. Oh, yeah. And then when one learns how to practice strong boundaries the boundaries given to us by the sage who has the experience when we can inhabit the space of gentleness and sensitivity and wonder to the world around us we're fueled by this magical force that just makes living easier and when we receive the wisdom of the sage who has had the experiences who has the clarity of vision that cuts through the artificial of the world, that cuts through other people's personas, that can see what's really deep down there. I think being able to find those, the best of both of those, the, the wonder that whose naivety is checked and the wisdom whose callousness is checked. Mm -hmm. Being able to inhabit both of those spaces is really like it's like DMX in an orchard in an orchid garden. <laughs> it's it's really like Mike Tyson slipping into the perspective of humor and gentleness. Yeah. Because we really can be complex. We can outstep the the parameters of this really narrow definition of masculinity that we're that a lot of us have been forced to perform that's one mm -hmm. persona that i think is unilaterally imposed on men. yeah it's really cool you bring up masculinity that's something i explore pretty much every podcast in some way it comes up just the concept of uh masculinity and, and the need to redefine it the need to re-personify what it means to be a masculine male and really the need to uh, take control and take back uh, the definition. I think, you know, there's such a lack of balance. I think of balance and, and, and men today, they're either 
Um, there's just imbalance, you know, you can be too macho and too strong and too chauvinistic and too this, or you can be yeah. kind of weak and, and you lose the manly qualities of decisiveness and being right. a protector and being absolute and being a guide and, and, yeah. and being a man. And so that's like the spectrum is just going away. It's like, you're either really off yeah. and, or, and, or you're just too weak, you know? And I don't say weak as in like a bad thing, but I'm, there is, there are archetypes of what a man should be that work yeah. for the progression of society and humanity. And a good man really has to have strength so that he can pursue virtues of honor and integrity yeah. and honesty. These things don't just yeah. come to you. You have to pursue them. You have to work towards them. And it takes commitment. It takes courage to actually be a good man. You don't just wake up one day and you're a great man. And then, of course, there's the unlearning of, of the toxic max masculinity yeah. that we're all the product of. It doesn't matter because if you grew up in America and you didn't even have a father, you're still a product of toxic masculinity because you see it everywhere. You observe it everywhere. You take it in as a child. You're a sponge. You see it in your coach at school. You yeah. see it in your principal. You see it on the president on TV. You see right. it on the main character in the movies you're watching. Yeah. You see it in the video games you're playing. You see it in the magazines you're reading. It's everywhere. You're inundated with this toxic image. Yeah. You know, and so it's time as men that we take accountability right. and that we personify what it means to be a godly man, yeah. to be a responsible man. And when I say godly, I'm not talking about the straight laced Christian, you know, right. I'm a godly guy. You know what right. I mean? <laughs> I'm a god you know, man. Yeah. We're created we're created beings by a loving cosmic creator that is much bigger than anybody knows. Yes. Doesn't fit in any book, doesn't fit in any ism or schism. You Ooh. know? Ooh, that's such a nice phrase. That's great. <laughs> and, you know, I, I really think of that as just existing in the the perpetual reverence of that moment. Mm -hmm. I'm living and being in that perpetual state of sensitivity to what the world is saying, listening to what my intuition is saying, listening to what the world is saying. That's one of the times where I feel the closest to that which creates. Mm -hmm. That's good that you say being a, a listener, a good listener, because I think that's one of the biggest problems uh, with men today is we're not good listeners. Yeah. We don't listen to the women in our lives whether it be our significant other, whether it be our sister, our mother, yeah. our, our friend, we're not good listeners. Right. And we need to start listening. And I think, you know, right now with the whole Me Too movement, which is right. proper and needs to take place. Yeah. Um, it's something that we ought to listen to. It's something we need to listen to. Yeah, there's going to be some things taken advantage of. There's going to be some exaggerated situations. There might be some people, whatever, taking advantage of the Me Too movement right. in some ways. But... The fact is that it's time for men to take accountability for their actions. Yes. That the, the way we live, the way that we treat women, yes. the way that we view things needs to change. We need to be responsible and that it's wrong. Yeah. You know, we, we're not being told, hey, that's wrong. Don't right. do that. Stop that. Right. We haven't been told that enough as men for the last three, four, five, six, seven hundred years on the screen. Yeah. You know? You know, a thousand years, two thousand years. I we can keep going back. Yeah, okay, you know, yeah. we're living mean, patriarchy and the wrong abuse of male power on this planet There's goes a back deep, a long time, deep, man. Deep, deep generational curse of our sex. Yeah, and I think it's exciting that uh, we live in an age now where we can share and get out to the world. Like, hey guys, we can do this different. Yeah. We can be better men. We can be more vulnerable. We can be more honest. We can be more gentle. You can be strong and gentle at the same time. Yes. In fact, someone who truly is strong is actually gentle be yes. at the same time because you have to have both. You do. Uh, strength without gentleness is not strength. It's just, it's meaningless because you can't actually activate it in, in divine harmony. Right. It becomes brutality, I think. Exactly. Yeah. Strength without gentleness is brutality. It's domination. It's oppression. And it's force, yeah. you know, but strength uh, with gentleness is energy. Yes. Yes. Different than force. It's an energy. Yes. Something really hit me so deeply when you were talking earlier about that, that paradigm that exists of the two extremes of the, mm -hmm. the man obsessed with the toxicity of strength and the man that is utterly devoid of the healthy aspects of masculinity. 
Mm-hmm. It reminds me of a time in my journey when I first came to confrontation with the ugliness of some of the things that I had learned. In the beginning part of my own deconstruction, I had a point where I wholeheartedly, 100% and entirely rejected everything masculine. Mm-hmm. Because I had such an explosive reaction to seeing the harm that was being inflicted to other people from some of these unhealthy aspects. I wasn't able to differentiate. Mm -hmm. And I threw the baby out with the bathwater. There was a point for a long part of my time where I was this really i had so much energy i had a lot of charisma i was really intense and i loved being intense i had so many of the aspects of what a strong man had gusto passion fervor and i became so caught up in timidity and guilt and fragility Mm and Mm. fear and undeservedness and the thought that i should be the last person talking to you i was Mm. policing myself in every waking moment instead of living in community Mm. and that way that i rejected the healthy aspects the dependability the the gentleness the communication the specificity the boundaries the the ability to listen even when i was quiet i wasn't able to listen to other people because i was so obsessed with am i being quiet enough am i being quiet enough (laughs) and why you really yeah unhealthy way for me to be small and as i let go of that which didn't serve me i had to build myself up again after that point now after years of work I finally feel in a place where I have found my rooted presence again. Hmm. And that reunion was so beautiful. But what really stirred that experience in me of what happened when I lost everything about masculinity. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that because that is actually a poignant, powerful and beautiful self analysis of your process. Thank you. And I think it's almost a micro your micro process is kind of like to me a an example of the macro reality of the of what's happened with men and uh, thousands hundreds of thousands millions of men on the macro level of not trusting themselves anymore going yeah. to the wrong end of the spectrum into that weakness into that indecisiveness into that lack of passion that lack yeah. of fervor and wanting to take responsibility and it, they've gone to the other end of the spectrum and so now it's all good man everything goes they don't want to say no don't do that right They don't want to say, hey, that's wrong. Hey, bro, it's all good. And that's too much relativity because it's not all good. There's a lot of things that aren't good. And as a man, you got to be able to take take charge and say what's not all good. And so I think what you just shared there was a really powerful little testimony that I think would help a lot of men grow. So I appreciate you sharing that because, and you know what? We're going to have those moments all throughout our ascension in this life. Yes. We're going to keep growing. It's not like you've arrived and you're perfect now. You're going to have another process where you've come through just as I am, and we're going to keep deconstructing, keep learning, keep getting more balance. But the process you got to is, wow, I'm actually being too weak. I've lost trust in myself. Yes. And I'm appeasing this guilt. Yes. Uh, basically this, and it's almost this macro guilt of all men, collective, and it's affecting my own personal psyche And I'm becoming weak in a lot of ways. And, you know, that process you had is powerful and needs to happen for millions of men. And it will continue to happen in different ways in our lives as we grow as men, as we heal. It's constantly refining, you know. And my wife, God bless her, she's always she's always telling me, you know, don't be so dramatic about your 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 flaws. It's really just right. Think of, think of it about, is that you need to refine more. Yeah. You're refining. It's just refining. It's like, it you know, and if we, I can really beat up on myself. I think my whole, you know, I'm just so terrible and this and that. I'm completely flawed. And it's like, you know what? It's just, you just need a little sandpaper in some areas to smooth out, you know? 
and, and, and give ourselves some grace, you know, but also recognize that we need the sandpaper. Having that balance, there's the duality again, you know, of growing. And you can't have, other people can't really do it for us either. Yeah. It's like we have to take the sandpaper and do it. And they, they can point out and say, there's a rough patch. You might want to smooth it out a little bit on your on your soul, on your right. personality. There's a rough patch. Go ahead and give it a little sand. And we can either respond with humility and gratitude for the, or we can respond with you know, arrogance, pride, and, yeah, intention. And what do you, who are you to tell me that? Yeah, yeah, and that's, yeah. Right. And it's cool. It's cool that we're having this conversation. And I wish that millions of men were. Yeah. You know, I wish it was happening on a global level. I wish, I wish that men who had, hundreds of thousands and millions of followers on their platforms yeah. were saying this yeah. instead of the BS they're saying, you know, talk about the wrong use of power and the misuse of power and, and just delivering needing um, meaningless banter again, instead of delivering yeah. and taking responsibility with their, the audience they have right. and saying something of meaning and saying, Hey, look guys, let's do this better. Let's be good men. They're saying they're actually promoting the opposite right. power. This is what it means. Got to do this. Take women. Basically misogyny, you know? Yeah. It's just really sad. You never apologize. You never admit you're wrong. You keep plowing through. You yep. you kill your opposition. And, <laughs> and I, I think of how many incredibly prominent and powerful men there are and how many opportunities they have to explore the harm they've caused. That's one of the things about the Me Too movement that I really mm -hmm. think. It's, it is a judgment of powerful men. It is yeah. a lot of our collective reckoning. Yep. But in it, there is an opportunity to respond to this harm with grace. To take mm -hmm. accountability. What happens if all of these prominent men who have allegations stacked, binders full, if they were to take tremendous courage in beginning to look at that mm -hmm. seriously? Yeah. And we have we have this feeling of that's gonna kill me if I do this. It's gonna destroy me, it's gonna rip me apart. It's going to consume. Doubt consumes the individual. Guilt consumes the individual. And we build up all of these layers to insulate ourselves from those hard feelings when really they are the keys to our prison cells. Mm -hmm. We are our own wardens. And the more we spend time running from this, avoiding this, the longer we perpetuate the collective sin of our gender and the deeper that encompassing guilt that neuters people exists in. Yeah. So I think one of the ways that I have found peace in navigating what accountability looks like mm -hmm. is by embracing aspects of the divine feminine within myself because I have found my divine masculine. I have found my present masculine tendencies of being decisive, of having genuine confidence, of mm -hmm. communicating boldly and clearly and truthfully. Mm -hmm. And how can that be nourished? How can that be viewed with gentleness? How can I sustain myself for work like that? And in order for men to take accountability for the collective weight of our historical sins, I really think that we need to invite the divine feminine to the decision-making table that exists within us, to mm -hmm. embrace the multiplicity of the expression of our souls. Mm. Yeah, very cool. It's it's kind of similar to a concept that uh, you know that I I study about. It's called complementary polarities, and also just the understanding of of a man and a woman creating the third mind coming together, 
And that leadership really should be both. It should be a man and a woman. Yeah. Because then both aspects of the circuitry, the father circuitry and the mother circuitry are introduced. Yeah. And so having more balance, you know, there shouldn't just be a president of the country. There should be two, a man and a woman. And they should be complementary polarities. Whether they're in a relationship or not, they're probably not. They're just complements and they're in a functioning relationship in the sense of complementing each other to make the right decisions for their constituents, for the people around them, if they're leaders, you know? That's deep wisdom. I'm blessed to have been raised in a uh, spiritual, intentional community. And in this community, I was founded by my parents, actually. And my parents, obviously, a man and a woman. So, but the leadership, <laughs> the leadership uh, was the, was my mother and my father. And, and, and so that had that. And so I, I saw and, and can witness firsthand in, in a testimony to the balance that comes from two leaders of, of the opposite sex working together. And like you were saying, it's it's the blending of the divine masculine and the divine feminine. Yeah. And it's so important, you know. And uh, Gabriel V. Ranch is my father. And Neon Emerson Chase is my is my mother, and they're both spiritual teachers. And yeah. and and they've they've built something pretty amazing here. One of the largest communities uh, in the world with a hundred people wow. from all over the world living on 220 acres in harmony with each other. And it's a big subject. And I think we'll talk on my next, but your, your next podcast kind of yeah. about what I'm doing and stuff. Yeah. I would but love that. it really, it really, it really taps into uh, a lot of the things that we've talked about today really flow nicely into the ways that we live our life here in a community setting yeah. with unity, without uniformity, with radical trust, yeah. with radical unity with balanced men and women, with respecting each other, all of these subjects we've actually taken here and, and, and created a culture where we're trying to personify them. I, we've created a culture where they're, they're existing, where that love can actually take place, that radical love can exist yeah. uh, because there's a consciousness around it that supports it, nourishes it, and helps it grow. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing with me, man. It's, uh, of course, your podcasts are, are great, so I really encourage everyone and my listeners to uh, check out our brother Fitzgerald's uh, podcast, Deconstruct. And uh, we've, we've had a great conversation today. We've covered a lot of territory. I and, really uh, have. It's been incredible. Thank you for coming on, man. You got a lot of great insight and uh, right right on the same vibe as me. And yeah. you know, my show is called Get Real or Die Trying. It's about just getting real and that process of getting real, deconstructing, unlearning, healing. Like you said, going back into the past, uncovering the wounds, taking accountability and becoming a better human being. You know, that's what we're all trying to do here. So, well, not all of us, but we should be. <laughs> well, that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm trying to encourage others and we're all in it together, man. One big family, so. Your words have inspired me to dig deeper into that capability we have. Thank yeah. you so much for bringing me on to this today. It's been a Yeah, pleasure. brother. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Peace out, man. Much love. Check out my website at getrealordietrying.com. Leave me a voicemail on anchor.fm slash get real or die trying. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or any of the platforms you listen on. Be sure to follow me on social media and share this podcast with your friends. Word of mouth is a great way to share the vibe. Get Real or Die Trying with Amadon Delerba is a production of Global Change Media. And remember, pain is temporary, victory is eternal. So, so I, just so I pronounce your name right, how do you pronounce it? Fitzgerald Pucci. Pucci, all right. So you're Irish Italian? Yeah. It's, <laughs> I say all the time, I am your classic European mud. I'm actually, I'm actually Scottish Italian, so That's you can, really you cool. can imagine the temper. You know, it's not good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you, hot blood. <laughs> Well, it's like, it's like on one side you get like two very distinct flavors of that temp, right? I see, I see really energetic hand talking and, and screaming bagpipes. Yeah. <laughs>